welcome to After Dark Online. Thanks for joining us again as we continue to explore the world through science, art, and human perception. My name is Sam Sharkland, and I'm a program developer as part of the team that produces After Dark. And this program is virtual, but the Exploratorium is located on Pier 15 in San Francisco, which is on unceded territory traditionally belonging to the Ramatush Ohlone people. We recognize that we are guests on this land, and we honor the stewardship and care that the Ohlone people have offered for the ecology we inhabit, both past and present. Now, I'm coming to you from my backyard into your home. A lot of us are stuck at home these days. Staying at home is critical to slowing the spread of infectious viruses, much like the one that causes COVID-19. Though you have to stay at home, it doesn't mean you need to stay inside. As long as you're being safe and taking the proper precautions, you can visit your backyard or a local park and really stay connected with the outdoors. With that connection to nature in mind, tonight we have an offering of Outdoor Insights, a four-part program that offers many different lenses into our connection to the natural world, whether it's ecological, biological, or cultural. We'll take a look at some of the endemic species in California. You can learn about a community, a network that connects black people to nature, and even about a piece of land in California that is the only federally recognized Indian land between Sonoma and Santa Barbara counties. So to kick it all off, we have Clay Reynolds, the mixologist behind all the cocktails you drink at Pier 15, is going to show us how to make the perfect libation for sipping by the fireside. Check out this episode of Drink Lab with Clay Reynolds. Drink Lab. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Drink Lab, uh, the intersection of science and technology with bartending. My name is Clay. I hope you're enjoying the great outdoors after dark tonight. Uh, I'm coming to you from the kitchen and bar at Loretta's Larder uh, inside Sea Glass at Pier 15. And um, tonight's topic uh, is about camping and the great outdoors. Uh, and recently, my wife took me on a wonderful camping trip, uh, really glamping, uh, if we're being honest. Uh, in Big Sur and it was amazing. It was a beautiful summertime, uh, the water, the trees, warm, hiking, just fantastic. But at night, uh, because we were in this amazing redwood grove, uh, which was dense, uh, when the sun went down and because there's not a lot of sunlight in general that gets in there, um, it got cold. It got cold and, you know, the uh, gin and tonics and the uh, frosty pilsners that you might want to enjoy during the day were not going to quite do the trick. Um, and I thought, wouldn't it be great? One of my favorite drinks for firesides uh, is mold wine, which is a drink, unfortunately, that has been confined to the holidays. Uh, I think primarily because of the use of this spice clove, um, but because it's so synonymous, I think, with, with Christmas and holiday celebrations and different things. But it's really a drink that's great anytime you're cold and you want to have something uh, delicious to kind of warm you up. It's also great because it's not super high in alcohol. Uh, but who wants to lug all this stuff into your campsite? So we, through the use of science and technology and a little bit of, uh, of uh, imagination, uh, are going to attempt to turn this into this so that you can have a delicious mug of mold wine at your campsite and still have room left for uh, underwear or whatever else you need to bring in. So we, uh, our main goal here, right, is to condense. So we need to take all these different flavors and try to get them into one thing. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was try to uh, tackle the, the, the alcohol component. Most mold wine recipes call for the addition of a little bit of booze. Um, different spirits depending on the recipe, but primarily brandy. So I wanted to take the spice flavors that are, that are ubiquitous in mold wine and kind of put them into the brandy and do it efficiently and quickly. So the best way to do that is using uh, one of these, which is an ISI or a, a Whippet um, uh, container, canister, 
uh, that's used for, for making whipped cream, for pressurizing cream and making whipped cream in restaurants. Um, this thing is super efficient at getting booze uh, flavored and infusing the different flavors. So what you do is you take, um, a, so for this recipe, we're going to do about four ounces of alcohol. Most recipes calls, call for about eight ounces, six to eight ounces when you're using a 750 of uh, wine. Uh, we're going to use a little smaller uh, vessel. We're going to use about 500 ml. So we're going to do about four ounces. We're going to add these spices, cinnamon, um, star anise, clove, which a little goes a long way here, so be careful with that. We're going to add those into the ice eye canister along with our four ounces of alcohol. And then we are going to take the chargers and, and pressurize it. Now, we're going to do two chargers. Uh, the first one you do, shake it up, take it out, do the second one. Uh, you can get these a lot of places nowadays, Bed Bath & Beyond, you know, a bunch of different places. You want to make sure it has this little indentation at the bottom. Uh, that's the fail safe. If it's a flat bottom, you want to pass. You want to find one like this. This will pop before this pops, which is important. Um, so we flavor the brandy. Uh, this can be done literally in five minutes, which is why this thing is so great. Uh, the, the cheat, the home cheat, of course, is just the old school. If you want, put it in a Tupperware and let it sit for 48 hours. Um, so we've already done that, and we've got that here. This is the brandy that's been infused. Now, this brandy is got to be put into the other flavor component of this drink, which is orange. Sometimes uh, they do that via the orange peel, but we're going to do that via the whole orange because it's going to become two things. One, the vessel by which we carry the brandy, and two, the sweetener. So we're going to eliminate sugar um, from your, your pack-in. Now, Mom, if you're watching, I apologize in advance, but in high school, sometimes people wanted to have something that they weren't supposed to, so they made it look like something else. That's where this comes in. Um, you can take a needle, hyper syringe and needle, and you, we're going to inject this brandy into this orange. Now, I did prep this orange to receive the brandy, just so you know. Uh, you just kind of want to roll it around. You want to soften it up. You want to get some of the air out through the, nave, through the end. Um, I took the syringe, pulled out a little bit of liquid, let some of the air out, okay? You want to squeeze it, you get it out. Don't worry if you get a tiny little split in the skin because we're going to address how to fix that later. But we're going to get the orange ready to receive the booze, and then you're just going to inject it in. Um, we're probably going to end up using two oranges. We're going to be able to probably get about an ounce and a half or so per orange. Um, but then you have this, your brandy and the spice flavors and the orange flavor all into one. Now, this is not airtight, uh, nor is it, is it now, because you've punctured it, uh, sealed and will hold in the liquid if you put a lot in. So the best way to fix that is by freezing the orange, which actually ends up having a side benefit. Um, a couple actually. One, it could be utilized as a weapon if you have somebody wander into your campsite late at night. Two, you can throw it into your cooler and it'll, it'll keep stuff cold. Uh, and three, by freezing this and holding the booze in, um, you concentrate the juice and it, and it becomes even sweeter than normal uh, orange juice, right? Because the water molecules that are inside are frozen and uh, you're left with the sugars and all the other components as well as the alcohol. So, you got your brandied frozen orange and you've got your red wine. Again, in an effort to lighten our load, we're going to use a canned red wine. This particular one is, tastes great. Uh, it's a red blend. I don't know what, they don't tell you what varietals, which can be a little scary, but I've tried it, it's perfectly delicious. Um, you can get any, you want to get something that's a little more full bodied though. I wouldn't get a Pinot. Uh, I would get something, you know, in Cab, Merlot, Rhone blend, whatever. Um, you're going to pour this into your saucepan fireside. You're going to let that heat up and you're going to let your orange thaw a little bit. Once this is nice and warm and bubbly, you don't want to boil it. You're going to take your frozen orange, which has now ostensibly thawed, uh, and you're going to cut it 
and you're going to squeeze that concentrated juice and that delicious spiced brandy right into the red wine. And then that will come to temperature and you will be able to enjoy a delicious mug of hot mold wine, fireside, and not have given up all the space in your backpack for all the other uh, essential items. I hope you enjoyed the demo tonight. Um, visit us at LorettasLarder.com. We have uh, a lot of different cocktails, including some of the, the, these things uh, for you to purchase. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Take care. Thank you, Clay. That drink looks dangerously delicious. If you're interested in making that for yourself, you can find the recipe and instructions on our program website at exploratorium.edu slash after dark. But now we're going to turn to a conversation with Rue Mapp, CEO and founder of Outdoor Afro, which is a national network that celebrates black connections and leadership in nature and inspires health of communities and ecologies. Rue is joined by my colleague, Estelle Davis, who is also an outdoor recreational enthusiast, in conversation around the importance and the vital mission of Outdoor Afro's impact at this moment. We hope you enjoy the conversation. Hi, Rue. Welcome to After Dark Online. I'm so honored to welcome you here today. Um, Thank you so much for having me. This is so much fun. And um, at the Exploratorium, as you know, a Bay Area local, that we're all about getting people to notice their surroundings and in new and unexpected ways. And um, on a personal level, I'm also really excited to talk to you, Rue, because I volunteer for an organization that gets youth um, on bicycles in Oakland and into the great outdoors. So I love that we're sharing this personal connection to uh, getting people of color outdoors. Awesome. Um, so I'm just wondering if you could start us off with a little bit of the purpose of Outdoor Afro and why you think it's important for us today as a largely urban society for people to rebuild their relationship with the outdoors? Well, Outdoor Afro celebrates and inspires Black connections to nature. Um, it's been a thrill to have started this organization from a blog in 2009, and now it's a national not-for-profit organization. And we have networks today in 30 states, and we've got a class this year of leaders totaling 90. And our participation network is about 40,000. And people are getting out doing all kinds of things. We're hiking, we're biking, we're birding, we're learning together and being together in nature. And I think at the end of the day, Outdoor Afro is a story of love and curiosity and community. It's so important, especially if you've never had someone in your life to show you um, how to connect with nature or model those connections to nature, that you're able to plug into a community that's here to help and support you and cheer you along the way. And it's also very much about healing. Um, Black people in this country have had a disrupted relationship with nature and the outdoors. And so outdoor Afro stand in a place of helping to repair those connections and to help people get their nature swagger back and, and really get more comfortable in the outdoors so that they can use the outdoors as a way to live a, their, their best lives as well as help our planet be healthier and more resilient. Thank you. I love um, the dog in the background. Yeah, I, I was going to say, can you, I, here I am calling in from my backyard, and uh, the sounds of nature are all around in Absolutely. Oakland. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I wanted to turn a little bit to this very current political moment. And, uh, you know, there's so much going on across America right now with COVID and a national dialogue around race. Um, and for me, I'm Asian American and not black. Uh, and for me, my eyes were really opened after the incident in uh, New York City when a white woman called the police on Christian Cooper, who's a black man who was birding in a park in New York City. And I was just, I was so disheartened to sort of have this realization that black folks um, can experience hostility for being outdoors. And that could actually be a, a, a thing that prevents that more access to the outdoors from happening. And so could you share some of the work that Outdoor Afro is doing right now in this political moment? Yeah, I mean, we, one thing to be clear is that Outdoor Afro has been 
focused on Black people being strong, beautiful, and free in the outdoors, anytime and anywhere. And it's unfortunate that the world, of course, had to see um, the filming of this, this particular, but not unusual harassment that Black bodies experience in the outdoors. You know, racism, you know, rarely leaves proof, but it never needs it. Um, but in this case, we had we had a moment that was undeniable of of race being uh, weaponized in, in in nature and in the outdoors in such a way that could have had a devastating or tragic outcome. And I have through my work over these years, I have had to manage those unwelcoming stares, those questions, why are you here? Who are you with? What are you doing? And these are in public lands. These are in places that are not even far away. Sometimes they're right in the city limits of, of Oakland where I was born and raised. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, you know, black people feel more comfortable often doing things in groups instead of alone. And, and we have, unfortunately, a very uh, proximate um, history of Black harm being routinely, um, um, you know, executed literally in the woods. Um, you can turn to the plaintive lyrics of Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, mm -hmm. blood on the trees and blood on the roots. And so we even have to rethink, you know, what trees and remote places, how they feel and how even to this day, you know, we have grandparents in our lives, living generational memory of this kind of terror that happened with black bodies in the outdoors. And unfortunately, that Central Park incident just brought that opened that womb fresh and new for people. Even if you didn't personally experience generational trauma is real. And I think everybody understood what the, the woman meant, um, what she intended. And so sadly, it happened in nature. And so, you know, Outdoor Afro, you know, is here to tell a new narrative. We're here to tell a new narrative about how we can be empowered and, and find in nature our ability to heal. So one of the things that Outdoor Afro has done over these years, starting in 2014, we've done healing hikes. We have done what our ancestors have always known that they could do, and that's to lay down our burdens down by the riverside. And that's how we responded uh, back in 2014 when, uh, you know, the, the Ferguson riots, you know, had had really uh, taken off all over the country. And in Oakland, we were no exception. Uh, we were taking to the streets. And I had to figure out how do I show up as a black woman who's the leader of a black focused organization that is about black bodies being in the outdoors. And I got clear that I do nature, nature is my lane. And that's the, the moment when we got out in those redwoods in the Oakland Hills, those third generation redwoods that are all about a story of resilience and regeneration. And, and that, that biome was able to absorb our frustration, our pain, um, our discomfort in a very different way than, than if we were in the hard landscapes of a city. And as I could feel that stress pouring off of us, I knew that nature was going to be key in this narrative going forward as a healer. So we've been doing healing hikes and now it's a part of how we train outdoor Afro leaders to really turn to nature for its healing capacity. And right now, right now is absolutely the time for more people to turn to nature. We're, you know, the, the data is showing that that being out in nature is not only good for our mental and physical and spiritual health, but it is one of the safer activities that we can do. And when we had the shelter in place, I don't know about you, but I didn't know we had as many children in our neighborhood as we did, as people got on bicycles and, and, and were on rollerblades and families were getting out. And then our parks were filling up, the parking lots were full. Uh, and so we knew as humans, we knew 
that nature was where we needed to go. And so I'm thankful that we can embrace this time. Outdoor Afro has always been about that business of nature and community. And so we, we, get, to, we get to still be who we are. Um, and I'm thankful that we can meet people in this great need today. Awesome. And so for our viewers who are watching today, who are uh, contemplating perhaps going on a healing hike, can you describe a little bit uh, the intention and the way to go about having a, a healing centered hike? It really is about making that intention. You know, there's not, a, you know, a lot of special, you know, um, there's no genuflection. There's no, there's, there's, there's no ritual. Okay. Nature provides the set, the scene, the content that you need to find your healing. Okay. And if you set that intention that I am coming out here to lay down this burden or to release what it is that ails me, or even just to go and talk to the trees, you know, like I've had some super like powerful moments with my friends, you know, just, you know, just the two of us going out and talking amongst the trees and, and, and talking about the world we want to live in and the things that you want for your life, you know, it, there's a powerful force out there to receive and, and, and reflect back what it is that you desire to have in your life, you know? And so I just, I think that the invitation is to really go to nature as that source, okay? And when you build that relationship with nature, you're gonna be someone who wants to take care of those places. You know, and I always say that nothing happens faster than the speed of relationships. And going to nature as a source of, of, of friendship um, and, and in true relationship, it means that you're going to start to notice the, the changes of the trail over the seasons. You're going to start to notice the wildlife. You're going to start to notice the, the, the way that, you know, our unique Bay Area, you know, has so many different climates um, that provide a lot of different feelings and experiences in nature. And also it's a chance to relieve ourselves of the isms too. You know, I always say that you go out and the trees do not know that you are black, okay? The birds are going to sing no matter how much money you have in your bank account. And the flowers, they bloom no matter your gender or your political affiliation. So we really can turn to nature to just relieve ourselves of those constructs and those isms that are all around us and all in the news cycle. Um, and, you know, at minimum, you know, nature gives us a break. So we're fortunate here in the Bay Area to have the climate and the many opportunities to get out in nature. And it doesn't have to be far away from home to experience it. It's in, it's from your windowsill. You know, during the pandemic when I couldn't really go anywhere, I looked out my backyard and I saw like my lazy pit bull laying on the grass. And I saw, you know, this um, blue scrub jay raking around. And I was like, Nature is just, it's just continuing to go right on as if nothing is different in the world. And so I was like, I need to be more like nature. And I was able to access that lesson without necessarily being far away from home. Well, thank you so much, Rue, for sharing that. I, I had a similar experience uh, in my own backyard. Here we are. Um, just looking on, realizing that nature was more accessible than I had previously thought. And I started appreciating things like turning over old leaves and rocks in my backyard and discovering what was underneath it and realizing that nature could be accessed in even those smallest moments. Well, so we are nature. You know, I think the, the problem, you know, that humanity has run up against and, and is the source of a lot of our, the harm that, um, that we've caused in, on this earth um, is that we've, we've seen a separation between ourselves and nature. And really like we are nature, like our bodies are mostly made up of water, you know, influenced by lunar cycles, you know, we're not like separate from nature. And I think that that's the big revelation that I'm hoping, you know, people really stick with during this time. Like you don't have to get into, like nature is not, we have to rethink nature. We have to rethink outside. It's not a place where you go and you access through a parking lot. 
you know, and it's also very important, you know, to recognize that even if you live in a low income community, the birds still come to your neighborhood too. <laughs> you know, like sometimes the neighborhoods that, you know, people are, are thinking are not full of nature actually are, you know, and especially here in the Bay Area where we are living along the Pacific Flyway. I mean, any, any moment, you know, in the, in this year, we've got, you know, all kinds of birds and other wildlife that we can look at right in our own neighborhoods, you know, so I think it's so important that we, you know, stick with this, like, asset based conversation, right? It's not about what we don't have, but but look at what we do have. And I'm so glad you mentioned the rock story um, because that's a perfect perfect example of, of how we can just stay uh, connected to wonder. Totally. Well, thank you so much again, Aru, for joining us. And thank you for the work of Outdoor Afro. And um, maybe we'll see each other sometime soon on the trails. Oh, thank you, Estelle. It was so great visiting with you. And I hope to see you in nature as well. <laughs> All right. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, thank you to Estelle. And a very special thanks to Rue Map for sharing some of her time with us tonight. If you want to find out more about Outdoor Afro, again, you can visit our program website at exploratorium.edu slash afterdark. Now, if you've gone out on any of the trails in the Bay Area, you know that there's an overwhelming amount of plant life to be discovered in California. The climate allows for incredible diversity and a rich pool of endemic species. Up next, Alex Pinnegis, one of our techs who keeps our Living Systems Gallery alive, is going to talk about some of the endemic species that you can find in the northern part of the California coast. I present to you Super Cali Fragile Ecosystems Alex shows us. Hello Exploratorium visitors. My name is Alex Pinnegis and I'm one of the biologists who takes care of our living organisms and exhibits at the museum. I imagine that many of you, like myself, have been itching to get out of the house recently. Whether you're a parent looking for an activity for your kids, or someone who's just been cooped up in the same scene for too long, it's been hard for everyone to find ways to safely engage with the outdoors. My goal tonight is to tell you all about some truly wonderful plants that are native to California, and places that are slightly off the beaten path where you can see them. One thing I find fascinating about plants and living things in general is the way they deal with scarcity. In many cases, an organism's success is defined by its ability to accumulate a resource that's scarce in its environment or simply make do with less of it. California's most famous native species is a great example of this. Water is a scarce resource for much of the year in California. With the vast majority of precipitation happening in the winter, many ecosystems go months without rainfall or snow. While annuals like grasses and wildflowers can simply grow when it's wet, flower, and go to seed as their environment dries out, trees and other perennials must find ways to collect enough water to survive the yearly dry season. And the bigger the plant, the more water it needs. Coast redwoods are the tallest trees on earth, so they need a lot of water. During the winter and spring, they receive it in abundance, but they still need to find water during the dry summer and fall. With their wide, shallow root systems, redwoods are less able to access deep sources of groundwater. Additionally, due to their tremendous height, their water transport systems can have great difficulty getting water from their roots to their tops. To deal with these difficulties, redwoods harvest water from coastal fog. They absorb water through their leaves and their bark, giving them a water source in the dry months and making sure their crowns are well hydrated. In addition, water condenses on the leaves of redwoods and drips down to be collected by their roots and the roots of understory plants. One study of redwood forests found that two thirds of the water collected by understory plants in the summer came from fog drip. Coast redwoods used to have a large range throughout California, but due to heavy logging, 
only 3% of the old growth forests remain. While you can see redwoods in many parks throughout the Bay Area, the ancient giants are only left in a few places. Muir Woods is the most famous and closest to the city, but the crowds can be difficult in the best of times. I personally recommend checking out Hendy Woods State Park in scenic Anderson Valley, about a two and a half hour drive north from the Bay Area. The grove may be small in acreage, but it has some truly majestic trees. Some environments in California rarely run dry. Due to snowmelt draining from the mountains, aptly named wetlands stay wet for much of the year. However, these habitats can pose challenges of their own. Due to their acidic or basic soils, bogs and marshes make nitrogen very scarce for their plant and habitats. While some plants can fix nitrogen from the atmosphere, others have evolved to collect it by digesting animals. Animals, which are mostly made of protein, are full of nutritious nitrogen. One of California's most unique species, Darlingtonia californica, is a carnivorous plant. Also called the cobra lily, it is a close relative of the Saracenia pitcher plants found in the southeastern United States and Canada. Like other pitcher plants, cobra lilies capture insects by baiting the entrance to their pitcher with sugary nectar. When insects find their way inside the entrance, they are often unable to find their way back out. The plant makes this more difficult by tucking the entrance on the underside of the trap, and with little clear spots in the trap called false windows. The false windows allow light in, attracting insects toward them and away from the exit. Eventually, the insects become exhausted and fall down into the pitcher where they are digested. The range of Darlingtonia is limited by their very low tolerance for heat. If their roots get much above 50 degrees, the plants will die, so they are happiest in areas that receive snowmelt for much of the dry season. I recommend visiting Butterfly Valley Botanical Area in Plumas National Forest, about a four hour drive to the Northeast. In addition to the plethora of insects living in the area, you may get lucky and see some of the valley's other inhabitants as well. However, the cobra lilies are off the path, so to get up close and personal, you'll want to check out the Darlingtonian Nature Trail on Highway 199 near the Oregon border. It's not a day trip for sure, but it's well worth a visit if you're ever in the area. When it comes to poor soil, Darlingtonia has it relatively easy compared to the inhabitants of the pygmy forests. The soil in these forests of tiny trees has been acidified and drained of its nutrients over hundreds of thousands of years. The acidic soil has hardened into a concrete-like iron hard pan, limiting drainage and blocking the growth of deep roots. This combination of factors has led to an environment so hostile that a hundred-year-old tree may be only 10 or 15 feet tall and a few inches in diameter. Only a handful of species of plants can even survive here, and none thrive as they would in other environments. These hardy plants include bishop and bollander pine, manzanita, madrone, and huckleberry. In some areas, the ground is covered instead with dozens of species of lichens, or is simply barren. Strangest of all, due to the terraced shape of the area's geology, the transition from pygmy forest to redwood grove can be sudden. A few hundred yards from the center of the pygmy forest, one can see towering redwoods growing in the more fertile soil of a lower terrace. You can visit Pygmy Forests in Van Dam State Park on the Pygmy Forest Discovery Trail. You can also hike the Jug Handle Ecological Staircase Trail in Jug Handle State Park to see a progression of different ecological niches, including the Pygmy Forests. This is only a small sampling 
of California's incredible botanical diversity. We are lucky to live in a state with a dizzying array of biomes to explore. I highly encourage you all to do so and to support efforts to protect our amazing wild areas. Thank you for tuning in and good night. Thank you, Alex, for sharing some of those incredible habitats with us. I've been up to that part of California and it really is spectacular and I also recommend that you go and check it out if you have the chance. Now, as Alex mentioned, nature does not exist in a vacuum. It exists in relationship and there's a lot of caretaking that we can do. Humans' relationship with these ecologies is just as vital to their health as any weather, climate, or other pieces of wildlife. There's as much as we can do for nature that nature can do for us. So in our final segment, we're going to share a short documentary and a conversation about Indian Canyon. It's the only land continuously held by the Ohlone people, the first inhabitants of the San Francisco and Monterey Bay areas. It's emblematic of the caretaking and stewardship of land by Ohlone culture and now has been opened up for all indigenous people as a space for prayer and ceremony. The director of the short film, Rucha Chitnis, and the daughter of the subject, Canyon Sayers Roods, will join us in conversation after the film. We hope you enjoy. We hope you enjoyed the screening of In the Land of My Ancestors. And we're so fortunate to be joined by the filmmaker, Rucha Chitnis, as well as Canyon Sayers Roots, the daughter of the subject that we saw in the film. Canyon, if you wouldn't mind setting the stage for this conversation we're gonna have about the film. Thank you. Mishmin Tuhis, Conrakot Canyon, Coyote Woman, Sayers Roots. <clears throat> I am daughter of tribal chairwoman Anne-Marie Sayers, and she has taught me that it's always important that we acknowledge and honor the land that we are on. Currently in these COVID times, I am in Tamian Ohlone territory, and because we are working with this opportunity to gather in community with the Exploratorium, I'd like us to acknowledge the land where the Exploratorium resides. I invite you to say the word Yalamu. Yalamu is the first village of the land before it was known as San Francisco and before it was known as California. I invite you to say Ramatush. Ramatush is the first language of the San Francisco Bay Area. There are over eight languages just in what we know as the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's commonly known as Ohlone territory. It's a contemporary term, so welcome to Ohlone territory. My mother and grandmother believe that when song, ceremony and dancing stops, so does the earth. I too believe that, so I would like to offer a grandmother song to honor our grandmothers, their grandmothers, and an all mother earth, but without them and without her, we would not be here. We share this time and space together for a reason, so it's with that humility, that gratitude, that present mindedness that I offer the song here in this space. I'm going to use my regalia, my medicine, as an instrument, as an impromptu. <clears throat> my my o kawa no my my o ka my my no my my o ka my my o na he yo kona le my my he yo kona le my my o kawa my my no my 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 Moi moi yo na ha yo yo kona le Moi moi yo yo kona le Oh oh and I invite you all to say oh oh thank you thank you I'm honored to be here <laughs> Richard can you introduce yourself <laughs> Thank you, Canyon, for the land acknowledgement. Uh, and thank you, Samuel, for bringing us back into the beautiful community of the Exploratorium. 
Um, so my name is Rucha Chitnis. I'm a photojournalist and an emerging filmmaker from India. And I'm born and raised in India. And I've been living in the US for quite some time in the Turtle Island. And um, so what inspired me to make this film is um, I'm born and raised in India. And I'm given to understand that Christopher Columbus was looking for my people. Um, and of course, as the story goes, Christopher Columbus got lost. He got lost by thousands of miles. Um, and then he got lost spiritually, ethically, and morally. And I really wanted to make a film that really celebrated the resiliency and the life work of this brilliant native beloved elder, Anne-Marie Sears, because I personally felt when I first met her and heard her share her stories, her work in the Indian Canyon, and also the layers of stories, um, which I, as an immigrant, didn't get on a platter, the history of the California mission system, what had unfolded here, um, so much of the erasure of those narratives, um, and that ongoing uh, amplification of that dehumanization narrative for the dominant culture. And I'm personally inspired as a female filmmaker, I'm inspired by the stories of women who are flipping that script of dehumanization to reclaim their stories, reclaim their historical uh, timelines, and to create this powerful narrative for truth and history. So I think I responded to the film uh, just by being incredibly moved by the work of Anne-Marie Sears um, and feeling the need personally for myself to have a sense of awareness about what has unfolded. I live here. I am an immigrant. I am a settler. It's really important to unpack these layers of history. And, um, and, and so many of us care about environmental justice, climate justice. And the truth is, can we truly move forward in, in the right way if we haven't even acknowledged like the harm that was done and what were the systems and processes that created that harm? Um, and what can we learn from the brilliant leadership of indigenous women right here like Canyon? So that was sort of the story of what led me to consider making this film and having a conversation with Anne-Marie and collaborating with her uh, for this project. And it all sort of happened in 2018. Canyon, what's your experience when you're in Indian Canyon? My experience when I am in Indian Canyon is that I am home. My mother buried my umbilical cord on the land. Her umbilical cord is buried on the land. I am very rooted in this place that I call home, this home that I acknowledge and recognize as my ancestral homelands, where my grandmothers, grandmothers, grandmothers have always been from. I recognize that I am a very lucky and privileged California native able to say that I was born and raised on my ancestral homelands. And I'm also very privileged to acknowledge that I was raised around ceremony. I was raised around community members recognizing indigenous protocol, which is when you are not on your ancestral homelands, it is really important to acknowledge the original peoples, the original stewards and the history of that land and seek permission to be there and to engage or participate in ceremony. So I witnessed many intertribal and even international guests come to Indian Canyon to offer my mother gifts and seek permission to be there to pray on the land or to have ceremony or gather in community. So that was my upbringing. And I feel really lucky and blessed that 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 privilege has been afforded to me by my mother and her legacy to open up the land for all indigenous peoples needed land for ceremony. As a youngster, I do recognize I used to cry foul and claim that I was deprived because when I was young, all the other kids had technology. <laughs> we were, we are off the grid. So I, I recognize as a kid, I didn't totally understand how amazingly like rich and lucky I was. And now I, I thoroughly understand that I'm really blessed and happy. So I, I feel really lucky to have this space and to do what I can to be in community and to steward the land responsibly. So Indian Canyon is home to me. And Rucha, obviously the space is newer to you, but you've been there a few times at this point, I assume. 
what's your experience when you're in Indian Canyon? Well, um, honestly, I felt so blessed and privileged to experience and to uh, be invited to the Indian Canyon the first time because, you know, the first time I went to the Canyon, it was 2015. Uh, there was drought in California. I don't know if you all remember. <laughs> and, and, you know, when you drive to the Canyon, you're passing through Hollister and it's like monocultures and monocultures of industrial agriculture fields and there's vineyards. And then finally, when you enter the canyon, you I genuinely felt that like I was entering a different world and a very different worldview. Um, just the deep sense of history to the land, the biodiversity of native plants um, and medicinal plants, uh, such a sense of history, but also it was very clear when I was in the canyon and uh, learning the story, you know, listening to Anne Marie Sears um, share about her history and her connection to the land, to her ancestors, that everything was predicated on these webs of relationships to each other, a deep sense of responsibility to the ancestral history um, of what happened here, what unfolded here. So much of it was sort of erased in the um, Eurocentric sort of white lens of history that is taught in the United States. Um, and I think, um, uh, I just go back to this point of the web of relationships and, uh, to the, and the responsibility to the land, to the waterways, and to keep those stories alive. So it was an incredible experience. And of course, every time I have visited ever since that trip for the filming, you know, there's just this new unfolding or un revealing of uh, the stories and the history and, and a deep sense of commitment that, of course, Anne-Marie and Canyon have to, to keeping those stories alive, those traditions alive. And uh, that work in um, amplifying the narrative of truth in history is so central to everything as we are learning in this moment right now. Thank you. And Canyon, for those who don't have a context for what it means to call an entire swath of land home for those people who may have grown up in cities and only know of a connection to nature through um, city parks or nature preserves. Can you talk about what some of the differences are uh, between Indian Canyon and such kind of municipal constructs as those? When I think about the relationship that I have with Indian Canyon, and if I try to compare um, the life of a community member who is raised in a more rural environment, as well as when people have access to nature that, let's say, is under the responsibility or stewardship of any governing agency or municipality of a city, the difference is astronomical. I'm not going to downplay how the methods of any governing structure decides to tend or take care of the land. However, I do want to point out that even if we try to acknowledge these areas of conservation, the forestry department is technically still big agriculture. It's a lumber, a lumber farm. And there hasn't been considerations around the responsibility to the ecological diversity. So in being raised in Indian Canyon, it's a mile long canyon. And when I do travel out to possibly go to town for errands, have a social life, <laughs> uh, when I come back, my ability to observe any shift or changes, I even know how to track and hunt animals and I can know if any of them cross the road from as simple as if I follow my car tracks on the side of a road, remember where they were, see if there's fresh tracks on top. From any type of new erosion or a tree that has fallen down, many people are just like, wow, forest. And I'm sitting here like, oh, there's a change there. There's a tree down over there. Oh, look like someone drove over here because that area, the grass is pushed down from a car tire. I witnessed the land as if it's a change in my own body. I recognize that I am practicing to be a good steward and an elder or a community member 
told me these words, ancestor in training. And I've adopted that in my life. What does it mean to be a good ancestor in training? And I recognize that some community members who are brought up in a more rural environment do get blessings to observe nature, but sometimes manufactured nature. I'm definitely not a fan of lawn. I would love there to be more California indigenous nurseries and plants or something that brings in an indigenous mindset, like to re-indigenize the world around us. If there is an invasive plant, what can we utilize it? How can we utilize it in a good way and eliminate it if it happens to be choking out native species? I, I recognize how lucky I am. And that is also my goal in the future when it comes to Indian Canyon is my mother has always shared that the land is open to all indigenous people in need of land for ceremony and for education. We are not a state park, we're not a federal park. We don't get any support or funding from the United States or the state. This is pretty much our backyard that we've chosen to be available to the community. And by appointment, we have field trips and we have schools and volunteers, community service hours for our nonprofit, I want to strengthen that arm so people will get a chance to connect to the earth and have an opportunity to think about what does it mean to decolonize and to re-indigenize. So it's different than the world around that happens to be a bit more manufactured. And this is actually a question I have for Canyon is in this moment of social isolation and disconnect, which is pretty profound. Uh, uh, I'm wondering if you have anything to share with us, like how do we continue to have that relationship with the land, with the water, where we are right now? I currently am not as able-bodied. I'm uh, suffering from an injury. So it is harder for me to go out in nature, but I do know the elements of this time and in this place that we become a little more introspective, observing our actions, our reactions, and ways that we can engage with self-care, but also acknowledge our kinship to nature. So taking that moment to enjoy the sun or to witness the moon, to go outside to fill the soil, to start paying attention to the little changes, either in the garden or if you choose to walk and you know your your current environment, if it is very urban, pay attention to the resilient living beings that are around you. And one of my relatives said, if you want to look to the health, if you want to know about the health of the environment, look to the indigenous peoples. In what ways are we considering acknowledging the history of these places and spaces that we work and that we live, these places that we are putting down our roots and calling home? How are we in community with the environment and acknowledging truth and history? And then how are we thinking about how our actions and our words impact not only ourselves, but the next seven generations in the future? So in this time of social, social isolation, sorry, dyslexia, in this time of social, <laughs> in this time of social isolation, we should be kind to ourselves and think about reconnecting to our environments and witnessing all of the life that is surrounding us. Take that moment to breathe, take that moment to turn off our devices, to go outside, to take your favorite beverage, be it tea or water, or well, some people who have a long day at work might indulge, but to go out and just witness everything because there are ways that we can shift our environment and start considering how we're having an impact. I'm just, I love the beginning of this pandemic because I saw so much change when it came to the smog, when it came to air quality, I was like, wow. So I hope more people are being observant around them. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. And I'll just add one more thing is if people want to have watch parties with our film and have conversations and so please reach out to us either through Samuel or through Canyon. It would be really amazing to have local watch parties online and then also have and have 
conversation with Canyons. So that's something we're open to as well. Thank you, Rucha. Thank you, Canyon, for that incredible conversation. Uh, I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you want to learn more about the documentary or anything we've talked about on tonight's program, you can visit our website, exploratorium.edu slash afterdark. But that wraps up our program for tonight. We hope you enjoyed, and thank you for continuing to learn with us. We'll see you at the next After Dark Online. Mm -hmm.